commercial fishery, you know, 300 or 3,000 metric tons are annually. 500 people involved in it, and they reduce it. 70% of the sardines are reduced, which means they put them in this kiln, dry them up, and make flakes at them to feed to pigs and cows, which loses a tremendous percentage of the actual nutrition when they do that. And it really stinks. San Carlos is not a place to be when they got that plant going, trust me. We've talked a lot about it. The pollutants that they've discharged from the water there and the quality of life that they haven't provided for their employees, nine times the health standard for water containment. So it's not exactly a healthy place to be living in San Carlos. And that's your sardine factory, the shrimp. <coughs> they have the pongas going out and they're netting three to five hundred of them a night, if you can imagine, in this giant system. Each night, each boat, 300 pounds of juvenile fish for every 30 pounds of shrimp they bring in. That's 300 pounds of spotted bay bass, halibut, you name it, juvenile fish for every 30 pounds they get, which they sell for $140 at the cost of 105 for fuel and oil, which make the two fishermen make $35 from that. These are, by the way, 19 or 2004 figures, numbers. So you imagine with the price of fuel up where it is today, that they're not making anything unless shrimp are just selling for that much more. There are two species of shrimp, the yellow leg shrimp and the Pacific blue shrimp down there. And um, there, there, there's still a lot of shrimp around. But they'll troll the estros and just pull everything out. Gary was really shocked this year at the quality of the fishing in the estro that, of course, he's been fishing it nonstop for 12 years and says it's really bad. We're not getting all those big fish we used to get. I'm going, gee, I wonder why. It's obvious that somebody trolled it in recent history. And it's not that it, the fishing was bad. I mean, 200 fish a day is not bad. But I stayed outside the estros a lot, too, and fished main channel and other areas. Because I just, you know, shoulder to shoulder with five other kayaks isn't very stealthy. I mean, you still catch fish. But one of the guys, one of the veterans, come up and said, oh, it was a pretty good afternoon. This is the first day we fished only half a day. He says, pretty good afternoon. I said, well, how many did you get? And he goes, five. I'm going, really? Cool. That's great. I didn't want to say anything. You go, well, what did you get? Oh, 170. How and it was, you keep track of 170 catches? They have little beads on the thing. Oh, okay. It's just, and it's the only reason you keep that I keep ever keep fish counts is so I can tell from year to year uh, what the trends are as far as fish being around. That's, yeah. that's the only reason, not to brag about fish yeah. counts. <laughs> fish counts are stupid for for that purpose, like the party boats. They're using them to get people to count. If they counted every fish that came over the rail they'd have even more people, and if they threw them all back, they'd have even more fish, and yeah. their counts would, you know. Yeah, so That's why we have all these MPAs slapped on us. One of the reasons. Right. So each night, each night, 45 to 60 tons of our sport fish killed for no reason. Not good. What do they do with them? Throw them in the water. Just throw them there. Or on the beach. And we saw, it. we saw it. We saw it. We actually saw it. And, you know, I just, my Spanish isn't that good. And, I, you know, they outnumbered me, too. <laughs> yeah, good idea. And here they are with the boats. This is Lopez San Mateo. It was scallop season, so they were out chasing scallops with the little fish they had in the thing. And are they conscious that they're eliminating their own uh, jobs? Probably not, and for some of them, they don't care. They're just trying to make a living. Yeah. It's they have to. They're in a survival mode. There's no money. There's literally no money. No one has shoes. The stuff they have is worn. The guys are using these, you know, the, uh, diving masks, all the big helmets, stuff that you <laughs> watched in Creature of the Black Lagoon. Oh, you know? And some guys sitting there pumping the air down to him with a serious? hand pump. Serious. Oh, my. Serious. I mean, it, that's what they have, and that's oh you can God. see all the welds on it, and it's like it's not even safe. Not even safe. And these kids, of, of course, are the ones they're sending down. You How know. How safe do you feel them? Oh, as far as safety goes, yeah, fine. I mean, they were they because were, you're not near any big town or anything. Yeah, we were outside of town. We were 15 minutes down the river by boat on the beach, and they went past us all the time. Waved. Everybody was fine. But it was always at the, with all the drug running and stuff, and they're looking for places to hang out because it's, tight, it's tightening up. And every time we tighten something up, there's another knee-jerk reaction to that. Mm. So you need to be conscious. We're going to talk about that in the safety section. <coughs> and we took some precautions on that. And you need to take some no matter where you travel. 
anywhere because as an American, you're a target anywhere in this world now. You are a have and the have nots. And I could tell a story about what happened to me refereeing a soccer, a football match in London. This summer I ended up in the middle of the riots. We barely got out with our lives. Thanks to Irishmen. We'll tell that one later. So, the players. We got the estuary game fish, bonefish, red snapper, corvina broomtail, you can read. Bar pargo, spotted bay bass are number one. They're everywhere, absolutely everywhere. So, uh, the black snook was strangely missing, but you could hear them back in the mangroves because you can hear the pop as they go after the shrimp. The shrimp pop out of the surface and they go right after them. You can hear the snook. And they sit a little bit deeper and they're a little bit spookier. But there's definitely places where they're going to be more likely to be found. They like warmer water. So you have to go where the warmer water is. We were actually, the week we fished, in fairly cold water. The warm water was down to the south end of the bay where it's shallower, the south end of the whole ecosystem. The water down there, when we went, was 75 degrees. Where we were, it was 55. Oh. Right? Because, and you have to pay attention. We got temp break. We got um, terrafin. You got all kinds of pictures you can use, and they're free. You don't even have to belong to the service. But you can pick up that data and figure out what's going to be happening. I called Gary and the boys for a week and said, you guys bring, better bring waders. That water's going to be cold. Nobody showed up with waders but me. And they're out there in their shorts, and then the wind starts to blow, and you're wet. They were back to camp having lunch. I just fished all day. You know, never cold. In fact, sometimes a little warm, but you'd rather be warm than cold. Once you're cold, <coughs> the day is over, especially near sundown. You know you're shivering trying to get that last fish. It's just not fun at all. It's really not fun. It's just hateful. Now, remember that all these species can be found in each other's zones. They have caught tuna inside in the estuaries. Why? Because they're coming in and chasing what they want to eat. Just to, so then you're factoring all that into your game plan. We'll talk more about that. So these zones do overlap. But in the estuary, this is what you're going to see when you get out in the main part of the bays and to the mouth. The fish, as you notice, start getting bigger. Incidentally, there are sharks there too, including great white sharks. So you need to be a little bit uh, cognizant of that when you go out into the bigger water. In the estuaries, if they're in there, they're probably breeding and they're not a problem when they breed. Historically speaking, <laughs> the barred surf perch uh, is it a lot healthier and bigger in size down there? Oh, they go to four pounds. What? Wow. Four pounds. Holy smokes. Two to four pounds is in the surf. Now, we didn't run into any in the surf. <laughs> we were, found this one hole that smaller than this room, smaller than this room, pulled 101 halibut, averaging five to seven pounds. And we had big ones. The big one was 17 and a half pounds. Jeez. And those were in two mornings of fishing. Didn't find a single perch. Did find a couple of corvina. But that one hole, it was just that's like. That's okay. <laughs> you could see them going by at these doormats. It was like, that's fun. The guy said, Don't you, aren't you getting tired of this? No. <laughs> Are you kidding? This day's never going to happen again in your life. Yeah, right. I'm going to get tired of it. Go chase your little, go chase baby spotted baby bass. Yeah. Knock yourself out. I'm walking in the surf and catch them. It's too much fun. So quite a variety, as you can see. And, I mean, you've got a chance for everything. Wherever the water's moving, there's going to be something happening. I mean, it's just, you never know what's coming next. But we'll get to that. We'll get to gear. You go offshore, this fishery in the fall is unparalleled anywhere on the planet. I mean, it goes bizarre, just absolutely berserk. The neat thing is no one else can get there. Unless you have a long distance boat, you're not going to be there. Unless you trailer down there and launch out of the bay, you're not going to get there. Or maybe hire out one of the pungueros to go out and take you out. Most of the guys down there are not fly fishing savvy, so you, your Spanish needs to be good. Or and some of the other guys that run the tours, they know who to get hold of. Jeff DeBrown goes out from Real Baja. He goes down there and you can hook up with him. He knows the, the system pretty good. There's a few others, too, that are really knowledgeable. We'll get to that in the credits. So, lots of possibilities for fish. If you like variety, this is your place to go. This is the seasons. I apologize for the size of the print when I made the chart. Red is red hot and yellow not so hot. Tan, as it appears here, the light yellow. And then white, don't count on seeing them. Your halibut, obviously, during the cold weather, are going to be more prominent. Your marlin, of course, during the warmer water, which is left over, incidentally, in December from the currents at the Theatis Bank, the Theatis Bank in particular. That's where all that all the pelagics occur, mostly in the late fall there. They're a little bit behind just because of the way the current has to come around. 
the tip of Cabo and merge with the Pacific Current. The Pacific Current runs right down the coast past there. So it takes a while for that warm water to come up. And as we said, the week we went fishing, it was already generating up to the very southern part of Mag Bay. So the flush there was warm water in and out up north. It was cold water. And it's a large difference in temperature, 15 degrees. Keep in mind, anytime you get those sharp edges, bait fish cannot tolerate big changes in temperature. Even as little as two degrees is a lot for a bait fish. When you get 15 degrees, it's like a wall. Those bait fish do not cross that thermal curtain. They will not because they die. So they'll stay on one side and the fish, of course, find them on the wall trying to move and they just feed the wall. And that's why the guys that are good with tuna and the stuff offshore here, they're working those temperature breaks, right? It doesn't matter which side it is as long as it's an edge, a thermal edge, and it's real important. The San Onofre power plant down here, up to three degrees difference, water out versus in. And those flows, if you've ever been out there, you spin your kayak around. There's eight pipes, seven of which they'll use at one time when they really get going. But they create a nice thermal curtain, and the bass will line up from Joe's Finale Beam. We just work the curtain, and you just look at it. You can see the physical part of the water, but your temperature tells you the same thing. So, gearing up, flies, rods, reels, hooks, everything you need. These, what do you want back to that? Can you go back? Corvina. Whoa. We were taking Corvina. Uh, the white sea bears. <laughs> <Zeta> fangs? Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, they got, uh, we didn't see too many orange mouth, but we had the short fin. And we had the short fins to 15 to 17 pounds. There's a good pulling fish, by the way. <laughs> Our old favorite, taking just about anything. And then uh, most people don't take small flies. I was after some bonefish. You know, because they, Gary said, there's not a hope, there's not bonefish down in that area. <laughs> After 10 in one morning, he changed his mind. He's sitting right there taking the pictures. He said, well, you're not taking bonefish on those very often. It's a little big to get in the mouth. But, and they weren't huge bonefish. They were, to be fair, the biggest ones were about, probably about two and a half, three pounds. So nothing huge, but just make smaller tackle. When you're down there, do you have an average size rod, 10 weight? Ah, oh, glad you asked. <laughs> it's pretty good, huh? Good Luck of the Irish is what it is. Good timing. In the Astros. And if, if you have room for it, take a light rod. Six weight, and it's not to be generally used in the Astro, unless you're away from the mangroves. And, and all these rods, by the way, need to be stiff in the butt. Stiff in the butt. It's got to be in the butt, Bob. No, that. I am. Uh, no, that? No, <laughs> last rod. Now I'm dating myself. That's a Bob Eubanks. <laughs> but your rod there, it can't be really right. bendy because you're going to need that lower section of that rod to haul these fish out of the mangroves. And it's a tug of war, trust me. These guys were really funny because when we fish, we sit sideways on the kayak, you know, with our feet over the side so we're in a nice chair position. We have fins on our feet so we can maneuver the boat and have two hands free for fishing. These guys like to sit in the kayak with their legs in front of them, which has to hurt your lower back by the end of the day, big time. And uh, as soon as they hook up a fish, it's a point of the mangrove. It's like watching a slingshot. You hook into an eight-pound grouper, and the kayak just goes whew, right into the trees. <laughs> right into the trees. And then you get this guy, help, 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 get sucked in the air. <laughs> you say, you know, and they're saying, you need 25-pound test leaders. You need 30. I said, what for? You just need fins so that when he hits at the outside of the mangroves, you start kicking. Don't let him get his head in there. As soon as he gets his head in there, they'll take you in. And it's a long way back in the water in there sometimes, hundreds of yards, and there may be even a lagoon back there. We did a little exploring. We actually fought through the spiders and everything to get back in there. So the, leave your six weight on the outside. There's some areas for bone fishing along the main channels and stuff and flats, as we're going to look at in a bit. But uh, the, small, the smallest one I took was an eight weight, and uh, it, it was plenty of fun. My tens are, you know, we were taking two bass at a time. If you had two flies on, you were catching two at a time. You just feel the first hook up and then just count to ten, and you'd feel it get heavier as the second one would hit. <laughs> so six to ten weight, if you're going to fish big fish in the estros and the big grouper in, and they come in in the summer. You're going to want those. Those are big, mean, nasty fish, and they, those leopard grouper can pull big time. 